Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're very welcome to the, the second uh, evening event of this year's uh, Cork World Book Fest. And we're delighted to have back with us uh, Joseph O'Neill. He was here in 2009 uh, as one of the events in the year of the Constant Reader. Um, I think a, a reading and an event that uh, sticks in our memory, not least because of the, the gathering of the O'Neills which happened that, that evening. Um, probably one of the biggest gatherings outside of Chilon. Hmm. Um, and I'm also delighted that to uh, introduce uh, uh, Joseph as a, a reader and uh, to handle the Q&A afterwards. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Lee Jenkins from UCC, who's a specialist in American literature. So first of all, would you please welcome Lee Jenkins. Thanks very much, and it's a, it's a real privilege, um, as well as a very great pleasure, to welcome Joseph O'Neill to the 2015 Court World Book Fest. And as many of you um, here will know very well, Joseph was born in Cork, he grew up in the Netherlands, he studied law at Cambridge University, and he went on to practice as a barrister, first in London uh, and then in New York, where he's lived since 1998. Joseph is the author of four novels to date. Of these, The Remarkable Neverland, um, for sale as you can see on the table over there, which was published in 2008, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize for Fiction and was awarded the 2009 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Joe's most recent and even more remarkable novel, The Dog, which he's going to be reading from and discussing with us this evening, was published last year and was also long listed for the Man Booker Prize, um, thereby confirming my own theory that the best books um, to make it onto the long list in that prize don't get onto the short list, um, and if they do, they don't win. So Joe is the author too, as many of you here will know, of a compelling family history, Blood Dark Track, which came out in 2001. And that book tells the interwoven stories of the grandfathers who gave Joseph O'Neill his names, James O'Neill a Corkman and Joseph Dakat a Turkish Christian. Both men were interned by the British during the Second World War in the Kara um, and in Palestine, respectively. But um, notwithstanding his investment in family histories, Joseph has said in an interview that as an immigrant um, in the United States, to quote, you get to shed the narratives which cling to you. And in the case of <coughs> Joseph O'Neill, shedding old narratives means the creation of new ones, such as the intertwined stories in Netherland of Dutch and Trinidadian immigrants, Hans van der Broek and Chuck Rabakissoon. The friendship between these men, which is prompted by their shared love of cricket, unfolds in the wake of the attack on the Twin Towers. Now in reviews, Netherlands was very often read as a post 9-11 version of the Great Gatsby, a comparison that, um, if it is valid, extends beyond matters of theme and character, I would think, to the lyrical quality that Joseph's prose um, shares with that of Scott Fitzgerald. The dark comedy and the hapless protagonists of Joseph's earlier novels, The Breezes and This is the Life, and of his latest book, The Dog, have prompted comparisons instead with the fiction of Martin Amis. To me though, and I don't know if Joe will be pleased or, or take offence at this, Joseph is more like a postmodern Henry James, um, if we can imagine <laughs> such a thing. <laughs> In other words, um, an emigre writer, uh, a cosmopolitan, who is the master of the international theme and of the sinuous sentence, as those of us who have read the dog will, will know, and who, like Joseph, deploys a center of consciousness technique to great effect to, real, to reveal very profound um, psychological and moral complexities. So Joseph takes that center of consciousness narrative to new and dizzying heights in the dog. Set in the vertical city of Dubai, the dog is the interior monologue of X, an unnamed Swiss-born Swiss American lawyer, whose story, as we'll hear now, takes on the hyper-real, or in Joseph's phrase, fantastic actual quality of his surroundings. Um, so enough from me, and I'll hand you over to Joseph. <laughs> Uh, 
thank you, Lee, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. I can't remember, what was the thing about Henry James? I'll take it. I'll take it. Any first one in the fantastic. So, on that note, <laughs> um, anyway, it's good to be back in Cork. Um, and I put this in on here who's not related to me. <laughs> I think maybe one or two, possibly. Um, um, <laughs> Can, I, can you still hear me like this? Yes. Right, so I, don't, I don't have to do that. No, no. Good. Um, this has happened since I was last here. Um, so the dog. Um, yeah, and what I'm, I think what we're going to do is, uh, I'm going to read briefly from this, and then uh, Lee and I will have a, a little bit of a chat, and then apparently we then, we get a chance to interact with the author at that point. Um, um, this, this book is, um, is about, is told by a, uh, an American lawyer um, who um, flees New York City after a sort of catastrophic um, personal marital, sort of near quasi-marital breakdown and, um, and runs into an old friend of his in a bar in New York um, and who he went to college with in Dublin as the Irish connection. And because lots, as you, as you probably know, lots of, lots of American students spend a year over here, which they can barely remember when they get back. Um, and as it turns out his, his friend from college from Dublin, uh, he was a Lebanese uh, businessman, is a billionaire. He wasn't aware of that when he was at, uh, when they were students together. And the, the very rich man, billionaires are possibly overstating it, but let's, just, but let's stick with it, stick with it, it's convenient. Um, and he says to him, he says to our narrator, who, um, that, would you like to be the family officer for the family, the Batros family, um, because they need a family officer. Those of you who have more than 100 million will know, of course, what a family officer is. The problem with having 100 million plus, apparently, is that you, um, it's, it's onerous. You have all that money, how do you spend it? You have all these houses, someone's got to sort of, before you know it, your whole life sort of dribbles through your hands as you kind of, because your, your money, you're so rich, it sort of takes up all your time. And you, so what you do is you, you hire a family officer who takes care of, um, all, you know, all the, all the houses and the boats and the philanthropy. Etc. Um, and so this uh, narrator, whose first name, who never, he never tells us what his name is, except we do learn that his first initial is X. He hates the name, he's got a name that begins with X, um, and he hates it. And, but anyway, so, he's, so they, all, we, all we know, we'll call him X from now on. Um, he accepts the job and goes to Dubai, and then things happen or don't happen to him when he gets there. But um, the bit I'm going to read from, to begin with, it's only three or four pages, three pages I think, and then I'll read the second bit, um, is when he's still in New York and he's um, in a kind of, he's in a sort of person, he's living in, a, in an apartment building um, overlooking the Lincoln Tunnel. Um, and this is bef before he's gone to Dubai. It was around this time that every evening after work, I tried to run from my building's lobby to my luxury rental on the 18th floor. My intention must have been to become fitter, feel more competent, clear my mind, etc. I used the emergency stairway. To begin with, I could only run up to the third floor and would in effect creep up the rest of the way. Though I improved quickly, the going was always very hard after 10 floors or so. And in order to push myself, I suppose, I fell into the habit of imagining that I was a firefighter and that a fire raged on the 18th floor and two young sisters were trapped up there in the smoke and the flames. The problem with this motivational fantasy was that it placed excessive demands on my real world athletic capacities so that by the time I finally reached my luxury rental, I'd be in a state of very real distress 
because I was too late to save the two little girls. <laughs> Images of whose futile struggle for survival would pass through my mind in horrible flashes as I made my desperate, sweating ascent. A shower and a bud light would just about wash away this upset. But I doubt it was a coincidence that during this period, I found myself brooding on the story of the Subway Samaritan, the New York construction worker who had, back in January, jumped in the path of an oncoming subway train to rescue a man who, in the course of a seizure, had fallen onto the tracks. Specifically, the Subway Samaritan had pushed the fallen traveler into the trench between the tracks and laid on top of him while the screeching train passed overhead. I don't know if you remember this. This was a subway spirit. I deeply envied this man. Though not on account of the money and benefits in kind that immediately rained down on him. The subway Samaritan, who had acted for the benefit of a stranger, himself became the beneficiary of the largesse and assistance of parties personally unknown to him, including Donald Trump, 10,000 US dollars check, Chrysler, gift of a Jeep Patriot, the Gap, $5,000 gift card, Playboy Enterprises Inc., free lifetime subscription to Playboy magazine, the Samaritan had worn a beanie with a Playboy bunny logo during the rescue, <laughs> The New York Film Academy, $5,000 in acting scholarships for the Samaritan's six and eight-year-old daughters. The fallen traveler was a student at the Film Academy. The Walt Disney World Resort, all expenses paid. Family trip to Disney World, plus Mickey Mouse ears for the girls, plus tickets to The Lion King. The New Jersey Nets, free season ticket. Beyonce, complimentary backstage passes and tickets to a Beyonce concert. Jason Kidd, signed Jason Kidd shirt. Progressive, gratis two years of progressive auto insurance. I always laugh at the two year stinginess of that. <laughs> you know, the insurance sort of, how many years? We'll give him two years, that's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> and Metropolitan Transportation Authority, one year supply of metro cars. Nor was it the case that I envied the Samaritan his sudden celebrity and public glory. He could keep his bronze medallion from the city of New York and his appearances on Letterman and Ellen, and he was certainly welcome to his guest appearance at the State of the Union address of George W. Bush, at which bearing the title the hero of Harlem, like Lenny Skutnik, the hero of the Potomac for him, I don't know if anyone that, Lenny. He was the object of congressional and presidential admiration and congratulation. No, my envy belonged to a less material, though maybe no less indefensible plane. I coveted the Samaritan's newly earned and surely undisputed privilege to walk into a room, an everyday room, containing everyday persons, and be there received as your presumably decent human being, presumably doing a pretty decent job of doing his best to do the right thing in what is, however you look at it, a difficult world. But no, that privilege was disputed it came to my notice that even the Subway Samaritan could not escape criticism from the online community. Some members of which apparently didn't buy the whole story and suspected something fishy was going on. I noted that at the time of the incident, this man was escorting his daughters to their, i.e. their mothers and not the Samaritan's home, had inexplicably and recklessly preferred the interests of a total stranger to those of his daughters, and, reading between the lines of even the respectable threads, was a lonely African-American man, and thus prima facie a parental failure and a person of, of hidden or soon-to-be-revealed criminality. <laughs> I remember one electronic bystander invoking what he called the Stalin principle. That is, he rhetorically asked if Stalin would be a good guy just because he'd once helped a little old lady to cross a road. More clever than this small-minded chorus and more menacing to one's simple admiration of and gratitude for a brave and worthy deed were those who questioned the whole heroism industry. <laughs> they suggested that this kind of uncalled for and disproportionately self-sacrificial intervention was ethically invalid because it could hardly be said 
that good people habitually did or should do likewise, mm -hmm. and that moreover it was stupid retroactively to treat as virtuous an obviously reckless act that could very easily have had the consequence of depriving two children of their father. <laughs> Another commenter even proposed that there was no point in looking for moral lessons in the behavior of some unthinking, instinctual black man whose actions and their randomness and spontaneity and irrationality were essentially akin to the motiveless pushing of persons onto the tracks that also occurred in the New York subway. I was like, who died and made these people pope? <laughs> so that's the, um, that's the sort of scene he leaves. <laughs> that's his sense of the world in New York. And so he goes to, um, he goes to Dubai. And there comes a moment where um, uh, there are two brothers, and then there's the father who's made all the money. The father is called George, spelled with an S, because these, these are Lebanese Christians, and there's a lot of French spoken, as I know from my mother's side, of my, my side, my mother's side of my family. Um, and he gets the summons to um, to go to George. He's told to come to George uh, to visit him immediately on his yacht. And so he goes to the yacht. I did as instructed. The next morning, he's in Dubai work, he's just started his job in Dubai. The next morning I packed a bag, got onto the Batros Gulfstream 100, little boos in the family slang, and flew to Antalya, Turkey. From there I took a two hour taxi ride to a small coastal town. The Giselle, too big for the marina, that's the yacht, the Giselle, was anchored well offshore. A crew member collected me in a rubber dinghy, incidentally trying to break the world's water speed record. Waiting at the top of the boarding ladder was George Batros. He wore a naval peaked cap, shorts, and no shirt. Okay, yalla, he said to the captain. To me, he said, welcome aboard, and he kissed me on both cheeks. Somebody took my bag. Somebody took me to the dining deck. Somebody made me a gin and tonic. I didn't want a gin and tonic. But what the hell? It was good to, to have got out of the desert, and I'd never been on a private cruise or visited this part of the ancient world. The yacht, or ship, slipped past aquamarine inlets and between small islands where wild olive trees grew out of grey and white rocks. The littoral mountains, precipitous and forested, were beautiful. A cool breeze blew. I inhabited the world of Rolex. And yet I was jumping. Why? Because I am not a total dope. I wasn't going to fall into the trap of equating beautiful surroundings with a beautiful state of affairs. When in Beirut, Eddie introduced me to his father, that's, that's Eddie, his old college buddy, he said, you're going to like him. He's mellowed a lot since the old days. People who are sort of mellowed always make me nervous. Meanwhile, I had already figured out that to even begin to understand the Batros family, you have to understand the money. The Batros sons are highly remunerated, salaries, bonuses, stock options, employment benefits, but many of their largest capital assets, houses, boats, lump sums from trust funds, interest-free loans, etc., have essentially remained in the gift of their father, who was the majority shareholder of the company, um, etc., etc. George still controls most of the money, which is what it, is what it comes down to. He joined me. He had undressed and wore only a white towel around his waist. He unknotted the towel and draped it over the seat of his chair. Now he was naked. A pharmacologistical young woman began to shampoo his hair. Most of the ultra high net worth individuals I've met are idiosyncratically demanding, and everyone is familiar with the larger than life I make my own rules display of power. And I understand from Ollie, this is his friend, his best friend in Derry, he's a, he's a pedicurist of rich and famous, mm -hmm. Ollie. I understand from Ollie that gratuitous domestic nudity is prevalent among the rich and famous as a kind of very authoritative informality. But even though I had willingly entered into the company of George Backcross and maybe on some level had sought him out, I began to feel that my situation was objectionable as well as precarious. 
I had no idea how long I was expected to stay on this boat, or why I had been summoned. The Gisèle I knew was making its annual odyssey from Beirut to saint jean cap ferrat when Madame Bach Batros, nay Alice Rourke in Mullingar, Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> See, that finally, I guess, in recognition. Yeah. If you read that in America, no one, no one understands what that might mean. Yeah, everyone's yes, we know Alice Rourke. <laughs> um, was already summering in the Villa Batros, a magnificent clipped up mansion with a private jetty. Where was I supposed to get off? Perez, Portofino? Surely there is more than a trace of false imprisonment about hospitality from which there is no escape. George got to his feet and took a shower. The female crew member trained a high-powered hose on him as though he were on fire. He thoroughly lathered himself, dick and balls especially, and rinsed his hair and hopped around in the water jet. He kept chatting to me even as the crew member toweled him down. There was something faint, something faintly villainous about his showness. He reminded me of those clever murderers who for a while run rings around Lieutenant Canumbo. And how is your old friend, Monsieur Tromp? Oh yes, the reason he's got the job, or one of the reasons is that um, he accidentally attended the wedding of Donald Trump. And this is very, this, to the Backfoss family, this is incredibly impressive. <laughs> George knows that the, the father, the pater familias, is well aware that, you know, that that was a bit of a flu. So how is your old friend Mr. Torp, George, taking his seat, said. He was still in the buff, though now he wore his Commodore's cap. <laughs> Fine, I guess. I said, I don't really know him. Come, you're being modest, George said. Weren't you invited to his wedding at Palm Beach? That was correct, up to a point. Godfrey Pardew, the senior partner of my old law firm, was the invitee on account of the good work he had done for Donald Trump and especially Donald's father, Fred, in the realm of wills, trusts, divorces, prenuptial agreements and other sensitive matters. But Godfrey had declared himself regrettably unable to fly down to Florida and at the last minute he notified the Trump people that I would be attending on behalf of the, on behalf of the firm in the stead of Mr. and Mrs. Pardew. The wedding was lots of fun as it happens and I shared certain amusing details with Ellie. Um, and then, as I say, this turned out to be consequential. We'll skip this. I went as a representative of my law firm, I said to George. I'm not close to the Trump family. Ah, this is not my impression, George said. Then he was telling me about the crewing arrangements, two Norwegians, a Greek chef, and five others from ethnically prestigious parts of Western Europe. Their uniform consisted of white Lacoste shirts, white sailing shorts with the Giselle monogram, and classic blue and white boats. They all wore the same sunglasses. Uniformity aside, they might have been gung-ho young bankers on holiday. George said, these people are the best in the world. I said something like, yeah, they look like they're really stoked. He called out to one of the deckhands, Giancarlo, the fellow came bounding over. George said something to him in Italian. Presently, the boat dropped anchor. I heard splashes. Giancarlo and two others had plunged into the sea. They swam to the shore, climbed over the tricky rocks, and made their way up the hill to where a herd of goats was feeding on bushes. There was no sign of a goat herd. Giancarlo turned toward us and waved. He gestured at a black goat, and George gave him a double thumbs up. The three men jumped on the black goat and wrestled it to the ground and instantly roped its legs. I might have been watching a rodeo. Giancarlo slit the animal's throat. They held it down while it kicked and bled out. This lasted for some time. Giancarlo towed the carcass back, trailing a messy red stream. The three men stood on the deck, wet and bloody. They held up the, the dead goat. Bravo, bravo, John Batros said, applauding. Everyone applauded me included. You see, he said to me, this is the quality of these men. Unbelievable. Wow, I said. I see no point in raising the issue of compensation for the owner of the goat. <laughs> Short while later, a chef arrived with a serving dish. The liver, George said, fresh, fresh. He cut a piece off the red mass, squeezed lemon juice over it, and began to eat. Fantastic, he said. Take some. There is nothing healthier. I accepted a piece against my will. I did not want to put a part of the goat inside me. 
I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Why Dubai in the dog? Because in both of the episodes you read to us, they're not there yet in, in the city. Yeah. But what attracted you to write about it? Was it a recoil from New York, as, as your first passage might suggest, or kind of fascination with the, the strangeness of the city? Yeah. I mean, I hadn't really heard much about Dubai. I'd heard, you know, but just. And then a few years ago, I started hearing about it a lot, um, particularly in England. Now, I mean, people were working in Dubai. There was a lot of work in Dubai. Everyone was like, well, well I'm not just off to Dubai. And, and, and I sort of give one or two of my experiences to some of the characters in this book. Um, you know, I, mean, I was stuck on the runway once, and one of the air stewardesses was saying, God, I was always home in Dubai. <laughs> I said, Really? Why? What's going on in Dubai? She said, You know, swimming pools, Lamborghinis, David Beckham, <laughs> Brad Pitt. <laughs> So, um, so I looked it up online, just like my character does, and I was sort of, um, you know, very interested because it was impossible to tell the difference between the pictures of actual Dubai and the renderings of this kind of future Dubai. And, um, and I was also interested in this whole idea of renderings. It's because the city itself is a kind of a rendering of, of, of some idea. It's not even... It, it, it sort of, the sort of authenticity that we like to think attaches to a place like Cork, you know, a thousand years old, whatever Cork is, um, is just absent in Dubai. They can't, they can't offer this kind of story of authenticity. So they just, so they just have to go straight for these kind of Guinness Book of World Record breaking buildings. And the Guinness Book of World Records is very important um, uh, aesthetic in Dubai. I mean, they break, well, every, everywhere you go, there's a plaque saying this is the sort of longest air conditioning machine in the world, and oh, this is the most powerful kind of, you know, swimming pool, underwater lighting system. I mean, every, they have Guinness Book of World Records, sort of endorsements everywhere. And, um, and then uh, I started looking into it, and it became clear that I, what, what really interested me about Dubai, one of the things that interested me was that, um, it's kind of a brand new country, so they're starting from scratch. And um, only 10% of the population are what you might call native Dubaians. And the other 90% are there purely um, as workers. That's, big, that's quite a strange situation. And no matter how many generations you live there, you can't acquire the nationality of, you know, you can't become an Emirati if you can't be a United Arab Emirates national. Um, and so the state is basically, has kind of the whole trajectory of um, nationality, which, is, which we associate with the nation state, is basically not on offer in Dubai. You can't, um, and it's, that's, it sort of seemed to capture a sort of capitalistic arrangement a purely capital. It sort of felt like the future, and and, and you know, and you see what happens in Ireland, where the, the Irish nationality is now becoming increasingly difficult to get, um, and 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 the same things are occurring around the world as you know globalization begins to take hold, um, and so there was a kind of nationality of money present in Dubai that I that really interested me. But this. There's very little sense um, with that, following on from that, really, of community in that city where your unnamed protagonist lives in a building, I think, called The Situation. Um, yeah. And I, I was thinking um, about that in contrast to the role that the Chelsea Hotel plays in Netherland. You know, it's a cosmopolitan meeting place of all kinds of people from all over the world, but somehow it, it kind of works, doesn't it? That you don't feel that there's any kind of community in the city you imagine the well, dog. the concept of communities is very complicated in Dubai. The book sort of looks at this, goes or sort of investigates this. Um, 